Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar, DevExpress ASP.NET Grid View, Build a Questionnaire for Your Website. Building on a real world example, technical evangelist Paul Usher will show you how to create a simple but powerful questionnaire page to your existing ASP.NET Web Forms project, along with some tips and tricks for this powerhouse control. Thank you for joining us. I will now hand things over to Paul Usher. Thank you, Amanda, and good morning, everyone. So building a questionnaire using the DevExpress ASP.NET Grid View Control. What's it all about, and what are we expecting to look at? Well, a few months ago, we had a developer come to me and ask the, or present the problem. We need to show a questionnaire on an end user website, and we want the quickest way to put it together at using your controls. So we sat down and had a bit of a chat as to what would, it would entail and how quickly we could do that. And the result is some of the features and things we're going to look at today. It's going to start out by building an administration panel for the questionnaire itself. Now, remembering some key components here, we wanted to keep this simple. The information that was captured in the questionnaire was to be emailed at the end and not stored in a database. But there are so many areas from what we look at today that you can extend and build into your next web application. So we've got the question administration area that we'll look at. The next thing was going to be how it was presented to the end user on their website. And here we can see just a a small screen capture as to what that's going to be. So we're going to be looking at how to use the grid control with groupings and with different edit modes like batch edit. We can see at the bottom of the screen here, we're going to capture some more information other than just the grid. So how do we make sure that on a submit, all of that is sent back at the same time? And then the final part of the puzzle was sending that information through to somebody as a, an email. And we can see from this screenshot that there's the email that got filled in, formatted nicely, and that whole process automated. Now, as far as the actual data store itself goes, it was really simple. We only wanted to store the question set up. So the only table we're going to be dealing with today is this one called C questions. It has a primary key called ID. It's got a question number as a float so that we could have things like 1.1, 1.2, etc. And then the actual question itself and whether that item was to be marked as a header using a bit field. So with that, let's head over to Visual Studio and take a look at what's involved in building this. I've already created a project being an ASP.NET Web Forms application. But just to show that there's nothing going on behind the scenes, we'll take a quick look through these files. We've got the web.config file, which has the DevExpress libraries pre-registered in there for me. And I've got a connection stream, which is pointing to a local instance of SQL, a catalog called MyWeb, and the connection strings called my connection string. Nothing ex super exciting there. Inside our site.css file, if we bring that up, we'll see that there's a couple of entries, one being answer sheet, the other answer panel. And then we've got a couple of web forms themselves. Question setup, if I scroll up, has the assemblies registered? has the title set and nothing else. There's no code behind that form. We jump into the code. And then if we look at questions, again, it's just a blank web form with the title of questionnaire. And there's no code sitting behind the questions form either. I'll switch to that. So we're going to start out by building the administration panel. To do that, I'll jump to the questions setup page and go into the design canvas. 
from my toolbox, I'm going to look for the grid view control. So if I just type grid view, we'll see the toolbox will show me a few items and I'm just going to drag the grid view itself into that area. We're going to start out by specifying a data source. So I'll choose a new data source and it's going to be a SQL Server data source to which I'll call it DS questions and continue through the wizard. Because I've already got that connection string set up to my local instance of SQL, we're going to select that. Now, because of the simplicity of this setup, you don't have to use SQL Express. You could use local DB. You could even just serialize some of this information to a file as well. I'm going to go through to my select statement. And you'll notice I've actually got two tables in my database. I've got C questions and D questions. Now, the only difference between the two, one's already populated with data, which we'll use as the demonstration goes on. So I'm going to choose D questions to start with because I know that it's empty. I'm also going to come through and say I want this to be ordered by question number. I'll click OK. Choose advanced and I want the control to look after the update, insert and delete of anything that I bind to my grid. So I'm going to now just select that and go next. I'm going to test my query and there's a couple of questions that I was playing around with earlier. So what I'll do is in the background just truncate my table D questions as we want to start this from fresh. Test query and now I've got nothing. So that's a good place to start from. I'm going to choose finish and my grid control is now going to be sitting on screen waiting for some more things to be set. I'm going to choose a theme and I'm going to choose the mulberry theme. I tend to like it. it, it makes things look a little bit larger on screen, it's got some nice colours and it's just refreshing to use. Next thing I want to do is set the edit, new and delete buttons to be shown. So now we can see inside that command column on the left, we've got the new edit and delete. I want to jump into my column editor and do a couple of things here. The width of my command column, I'm going to set to 50 pixels. My ID column is not something the user needs to see or interact with, so I'm going to turn the visibility property to false. My question column is going to have a width of 50 and my is section I'm going to have a width of 50 which effectively will mean that any other space is allowed to be set for the question field itself. Of course all the bindings taken place so all the field names are already filled in. I'm going to bring up my normal properties editor here and start by setting the width of this to 100%. And we'll see in the background how that question field is then set to use that extra space. One other thing I want to do here is change my page size so that I'm not working with lots of small pages. And I'm going to set that to 50 for now. When it comes to actually editing the data, I don't want to be dealing with pop-up forms and so forth. So I'm going to come to the settings editing feature and change the mode from edit form to inline. And I just want to demonstrate this, how it will work for a moment. So let's make sure that questions set up is our startup page. And let's just start without debugging, try and get it rendering a little quicker. So when the page is brought up inside Chrome, we're going to see that so far there's no data display. I click on new. I'm going to be able to add a question number of one and it may be a section called about you. I'm going to say yes, it's a section and then I'd have to choose update to commit that. So we can see to do this, there's a couple of problems. One is it's going to get pretty tedious doing this whole 
new type something and so maybe have you heard and update. So it's not the most streamlined process yet. So let's just pause that and go back to our grid control. And we're going to change a couple of properties here. The first thing we'll do is find our settings editing again. And we'll change the mode from inline down to batch. The other thing I want to do is set the new item row position from top to bottom. Save that. And this time we'll run. So when I start adding items in here, straight away my new line is where I expect it. So I'm going to go, and I'm purposely going to choose 1.3 here. We'll just put some arbitrary text in, so something else. I can go new. And straight away it makes it a lot easier to be working in this administration panel. Here I'm going to do 1.2. And we'll do pre something else so that we can see what happens. Now the nice thing when we're working inside the grid view itself in batch mode is we're going to see any changes that we make that haven't been saved sit inside this nice color. So it's really easy to identify. I'm going to choose save changes. And straight away, because we've got that sort option in the grid, we're going to see that that information has now been put back in the right order. So that's starting to look nice. Obviously once I get a lot more information in there, it could be still a little bit cumbersome to maintain. So I'm going to do a couple of other minor things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to point now to that C questions table instead of D. So I'm just going to do a search and replace and that's going to allow me to point to the table that's got a lot more data in ready for us to play with. The second thing I want to do is introduce some more features to that grid control. So by calling up the smart tag, I'm going to come down and say show the filter row. If you are familiar, or you might not be familiar with the grid view, the filter row will at client side limit the number of records that are shown based on that filter. So in this case, if I wanted to look at just the headers themselves, I could do that. But there's one other thing I want to do here. I'm going to go back, back to my column editor. I'm going to come into my question number field. And then I'm going to scroll down until I get to the settings option. Inside settings, I'm going to expand that. And we've got this auto filter condition. When I drop down the list of choices here, we're going to see that one of those choices is begins with. So I want to override the default behavior and say, on question number, I only want things that begin with. I'm going to save that and go back and run it again. So we can see this time that we've got a fair bit more information any second now, sitting inside this grid where we've got six sections and lots more questions. If I wanted to just maintain my section headers, I could just use this really quick filter approach and now we can see that there are just the headers that are going to be shown. So it allows me to quickly go in and create new headers, look at what's going on with the headers. However, if I choose to clear that, it may be that I want to actually look at questions inside a particular section. So if I choose question number one, because of that begins with filter option that we set, we're only going to see the questions relating to anything inside number one. Change that to number two. The grid will refresh and I get to see only the items inside question number two. So straight away, using the grid view control, we can see some very powerful administration functionality being added. And best of all, at this point, we haven't written a single line of code. So inside our question setup, there's no code behind. 
we've been able to bind to a very simple table, we've been able to provide rich functionality for grouping and editing and the sorting, all from that powerful option. The next stage in building this questionnaire is going to be how we present that information to the user inside the web page itself. And of course we're going to use the grid control or the grid view control again. Now this time we'll start by sitting inside the markup window. And there are quite a few elements inside this page that we're going to build. Rather than you sitting there watching me type HTML or switching between designer, I've got some code rush shortcuts set up to simplify this. But I will explain everything that we do as we follow along. The first aspect of our page, we'll just get rid of the Solution Explorer for a minute, is going to be adding this panel at the top, which is going to contain maybe some inf set up information or some instructions. Here we've just added an ASPX panel control. We've set the width at 100% and pointed the CSS class at answer panel. The other option I've got set here is encode HTML to false. This is going to allow me to do some markup inside my controls, which is what I want. Inside the panel collection, I actually want to add a panel now. And we're only dealing with one, and that panel itself is going to house a couple of label controls. So we've got the ASPX label control. We can see we've set the font size to medium, and we've got some text that's been set. In the second one, underneath a break, we've got another label control with some more text. Now, I'm going to set the startup page here to my questions file and switch to the design view. And we can see that we've got that panel control along with the label controls rendering nicely. Underneath our panel control, I'm going to bring in a div tag. Now, this could have been done with another panel collection. You could have done it other ways. We're going through how to implement some really simple concepts today. So I want to show you some JavaScript stuff as we go along, and I thought it'd be nice just to show you how we can show and hide different elements at a client side. With this div tag, I've given an idea of thank you. I've set the class to answer panel. And I've preset the style or the display property to none. So in other words, it's going to be invisible when the page is initially rendered. And you can see from here, the only thing it's going to do is show that information to say, thank you, we've got your details, somebody will be in touch. The next step is going to be to actually put the grid control in itself. And I've just got a div tag that I'm going to wrap that grid around and nothing special. We've got the class at answer panel and we've got the ID set to question header. As I bring the grid in, what we're going to do is switch to the designer and step through exactly what's going on here. It doesn't, there looks to be a lot of things happening, but it's straightforward as a grid view control. So into the visual designer, and we can see that we've now got our grid sitting there. There's a number of properties being preset, but I'm going to step through every one of those straight away. You'll notice that we haven't specified a data source here, and that's because we're doing some manual binding in the code shortly. The theme's been set to Modeno, and I've disabled everything except for the edit feature on the grid. If we jump into the columns, all these columns were produced using the manual insert or the add feature, which you can see here. Now you can insert standard text columns, which is primarily what you might have. We've got an extra one down here for answer, which is a combo box, which I'll get to in a second. Each of the columns that are gray on the left mean that the visible property has been set to false. So from a visibility standpoint, we've got question, we've got answer, 
and we've got details are all going to be visible. Question, we set the width to 300, but we also set the edit form settings. We're saying if the grid is in an edit mode, we do not want the question to be editable, in this case visible. Obviously, we're wanting answers only from those end users. The answer field is a combo box. Now, if you've created your field as a text box and you want to switch it, you can use this powerful change to option inside the column editor as well. As I scroll down, the only thing I'm really interested in here is the items list. And we can see as I expand items, I've got two elements inside my comment box because all the questions we wanted to create on this questionnaire were a yes, no type option. And again, this is one of those areas where you could really extend this practice to provide different types of question answers, multiple choice, etc. But for now, we're going to stay with a yes, no option. I'm going to close out of the column editor and bring up the actual grid properties for the ASPX grid view control. Now before we get to events, let's look at properties. I've set a client side ID, sorry, I've set an ID of on the controller's grid and I've told it not to generate the columns automatically because we're doing that manual binding. I've got my client instance name as QGrid which we're going to be dealing with inside that JavaScript shortly. And as I scroll down, there's some other properties. It's critical when you're dealing with the grid view control to have a key field when you're doing especially data binding. It needs that unique pointer back into the record set. We can see from the bold options here that I've set a number of other things. I've set the fixed table layout. I've set it to automatically expand all the groups so we get that nice look on the page. Because I turned off the allow insert and allow delete, we can see that those options have been set here. Again, I'm using this editing mode of batch. Now, because we're not adding any new items, the mode is simply set to batch and that's all we care about. I've set the page control just to an arbitrary size of 200 and visible or false. Because I want the user experience to be just a scrolling list of questions, I don't want them to have to step through pages. So if I had a large questionnaire with more than 200 entries, I might turn that page size to a higher value or set it dynamically in my code to match the number of entries inside my record set. And with that, we now can look at some of the events that I set up. Now there's a handful of things that we want to interact with when it came to the grid. The first thing, first thing is going to be the callback. Well, not the first thing as far as program flow, but the first thing in the event list here. We're also going to do some overriding of the command button initialize. The HTML row created. You should see that any second. And then finally, the row updating method. So I've now got my control on the canvas. I've got all my HTML in place, ready to actually work with this. We need to set some code. But there's one thing missing. Because when it comes to showing the end user, I don't want this save change and cancel change. And I'm going to show you how to hide those from the user. But in place, we're going to need another button to take care of that. So as I come back into my code here, I'm going to implement one last piece of HTML, which is another div called answer panel, and it's the lower panel. If you think back to that slide, this is where, I'll just go back, wait for the slide to show up. This is where we could also put information such as this contact detail or additional information that we might want to present back inside that email to the admin at the end of the day. For now, I'm just going to use 
the submit button. Um, we can see that I've added, I've got float right on my style, I've got my ASPX button, I've turned the auto post back to false because I want to do this at client side. Julian often talks about the fact that JavaScript is the way of the future and I thought it'd be a good idea or a great thing to, to present as to using some of that JavaScript in an event like this. So let's take a look at what we're doing. Well, the first thing is we're calling this QGrid update edit. What that's going to do at a client side event is force the grid to commit any changes that it has back. And in turn, that's going to fire some other events, which we will see the result of when we get inside the code in a second. The next thing we're doing is we're going off and finding the Q head and Q lower tags and marking those display none, effectively turning them to invisible and then turning on that thank you note by setting this display from none to block. The beauty of doing it at client side is it's going to be instant. There's no, you, the end user is not going to be waiting for a post back or a page refresh. So it works really, really well in this example. Now we need to jump over to our C sharp and start looking at what is involved behind the questions class itself. Again, for time and speed, I'm using some code rush templates to make life a little easier. Now, the first thing we're going to need to do is bind our data somehow. So we've got this beautiful grid view, we've got the columns and everything set up to do what we want. We need to get that information through to the grid. So I'm going to say Q1 and we're going to see a couple of minor things happen. The first thing is we're creating this small enumerator of fields. I'm a big fan of using enumerators when it comes to passing ordinal positions for record sets and we'll see that in a second. Some people call the record set by field name and it's just really not the best performance option. And to make your code readable, I like using the enums so that we know exactly what field it is we're playing with. You'll notice that we've also created this method called getQuestions which returns a data table. And obviously that's what we're going to be binding to that grid view control. I'm going to go with the next block of code. And we can see here I'm creating a new data table called questions. The first thing to do is come through and add the definitions of each of the columns. So I'm mapping these to what was used in the database. And you might have noticed that there were a couple of extra fields in the grid view control that aren't in the database. So we've got things like answer and details. We can quickly create those on the fly inside this data table. I'm setting my type, so integer, the double to match the float, etc. And then down here, I'm creating a index. This is the primary key that we pointed to back in the grid view control that's critical for when you're doing data binding and editing. So the next thing we need to do at this point is actually populate that data table. I'm going to bring in another small amount of code and we'll step through. What we're going to do is create this this connection to SQL and then loop through our record set. One thing I want to point out here is this redundancy of our namespace. One of the really nice features inside CodeRush is the ability to come along and remove the type qualifier. So what it's going to do is find all instances of my namespace. It's going to replace them and put the using statement at the top of the class if needs be. So I'm going to choose that just to make the code a little bit easier to read. We can see that we're setting up a new instance of a SQL connection and we're reading the connection string from our web.config that we set up earlier. So I don't have to worry about setting up usernames or doing authentication. It's already available in my web.config. Next I come through and I actually open that connection to the server. 
and I create a new SQL command passing in our SQL, which effectively is each of our column names from our C-Questions table. We're holding back with any record locking and ordering by question number. The results of that read are passed back to this record set or the SQL data reader. And then we're setting a couple of properties or variables along the way. This, then we get into where the actual work happens and that's inside this while loop. We're going to loop through every record that's available and by default say that the section is false and the section name is empty. Here we're going to say if the is section field inside the database is DB null, sorry, is not DB null, then we actually have a section to deal with and we will set the section name based on that field. There is one minor issue with this line of code. We should also check if it's not null or if it's false. Um, for now, we'll just leave it as is, but in fullness, we would extend that out. The last thing we do is add a new row to our data table, passing in each field from the record set into the column. And this is where those enumerated types come in handy. I could pass in either a string literal telling it my field name, which I don't think is very performant, or just the actual integer value, which would make the code less readable. So here we can clearly identify which of the fields we're passing in. You'll notice that we're presetting the answer to false and presetting the details to blank. But what we end up with after we close the record set and close the connection is a data table that we can pass back to that grid that's now ready to use. So how do we actually then make that work inside the binding? We come along and use Q4. We're going to serialize that data table out to session. So the first time the page load happens, we're going to say is session, and we're just using Q for questions. If it's null, then set the session to get questions. The reason I've chosen to do it this way, and again, remembering the initial requirements was something that was quick to implement and easy for the user to maintain and use. Once this data table is serialized to session, we can store the answers as a temporary storage space. We're not having to go back to SQL, we're not having to update other tables and do all this extra maintenance. And it works really quite nicely. So once we've got that session set up, we're going to set the data source of the grid to that session property. And providing we're not inside a postback or a callback, we're going to tell it to actually bind that data to the grid. So that takes care of the page load and everything else that's happening. Now, the next stage is to then implement the events that we talked about on the grid control. What we said was there was the command button initialize, the HTML row create, the row updating, and the callback event. So after it's performed the callback, we want to do something. There isn't a great amount of code behind any of these. So let's quickly step through and see what's going on. The command button initialize gets called when we render the save changes or the command options here. And effectively what I'm saying is I don't want to see it. Don't show me the save changes or the cancel changes option. And it's as simple as setting that E visible property to false. The next thing I want to do, if you think back to our table structure, we've got rows in our table that represent the headings themselves. Now, when we set up the grid control, I'm just going to switch back to the designer, back to our column editor, and choose columns. One thing I neglected to mention was the fact that section ID has been set as a group field. So I came through and set the group index on section ID to zero. I told it it's the first sort to apply, 
and I told it that the sort order isn't ascending. So effectively what that will perform, my grid will be shown in groups each time there is a new section to be displayed. So the last thing that I want to see happen is to have extra rows presented when my grid is rendered, showing that those sections are appearing again. So here I'm going to bring in another little bit of code and I'm going to say if the row type is equal to a data row, so we know we're dealing with the rendering of specific data, providing the key value is not null and that the boolean value of is section is true, hide that row. So in other words, if it encounters a row that's to be rendered as a section header inside the detail body, hide it. Nice and simple. We then have the row updating method. And there's some interesting things going to happen here because this is where effectively we're binding the answers that the end user is typing back to our session so that we can process it inside our email client later on. We're setting up a new data row object and then we're casting from our session the result of the row that's being edited. So if I try and explain this, imagine where we've just finished typing in some answers to question number five. The ID of question number five is then passed back inside this keys collection. We do a lookup and find that inside the rows collection and we're setting that so that we can work with it. We are then coming through and saying set the answer field on row to whatever they've said yes or no and set the details to whatever they've typed into the details column. Because this is being serialized back to that session, I'm finished with it. I don't need to let the grid do anything else. There's no other binding. There's no backstore to be done after that. So I can come along and cancel the edit on the inside this method. I can force the grid itself to cancel any changes that have happened and I can rebind my grid which of course means that the answers that are stored inside the session will be shown on the grid. So it's a very important aspect to what we're dealing with but straightforward at the same time. And then finally we need to say what happens when the grid is finished doing its binding and effectively we're, we're ready now to submit those answers back. Well, all we're going to do here is call a method that is send questions as email. And obviously that method doesn't exist yet. It's going to be the final piece in the puzzle. When I create the method, we'll see that it's straightforward. It's just a, a nice simple void. We're instantiating a new string builder which is a great way of collecting lots of text in rows. And then we're looping through every data row inside that session that was saved. The first thing we're going to do is say if the user presented, sorry, if the row is a section, we want to format it slightly differently. And so here I'm just using a string format. I'm putting some markup in and saying return the section name. So effectively making the section name bold and then passing a, a line break. If it's not a section, I want to append the details of the question and the answer. I just scroll along a little bit. We can see that again with markup, I'm doing it as a list item and I'm passing in the question. I'm passing in the answer and I'm replacing the stored Boolean from true or false to yes or no, just with an inline replace there. And then finally, I'm passing in a, the answer to the question if they've added extra details. Down here, I'm creating a new string, which is going to be the body of my email, using some more markup and simply saying, hello, we've filled out a questionnaire and pass in all the answers to that which results in the 
email that you saw earlier on. Go back to the slide. In something like this being shown, where the recipient receives a nice HTML formatted email, which has got all the sections in bold, then list items with the answer in bold, so it draws your attention, and any extra text has been written at that point. The last line of code is going to call out to our mailer class and say send mail. It's passing in a property which represents whether we're using a default sender, the subject and the body. We'll spend a couple of minutes just having a look at that class because it is a great little helper class. All built using the .NET mail framework. Obviously inside the presentation I'm not going to be using real mail details so it's up to you to populate this with things that would work on your server. We've had some great success using both Microsoft Exchange and things like Gmail when using this mailer class. So it's, it's really nice to start implementing if you want to automate emails going out. Effectively, effectively what we have is the setup, we've got the server information, the port details, and then some default bits. You might store those in a database, so they're secure, etc. I just need to show you that the values are required. We've got this override method here which is send mail asking if we want to use the default sender and then we've got the subject and the body but the one that does all the work is this send mail method here and effectively what we've got happening it creates a new mail message passing in those parameters and saying the fact that we want to create a HTML based email if we were dealing with carbon copies, it will add a carbon copy in. And then it creates an instance of the SMTP mail client, sets everything, port, delivery method, where the credentials are required, what the server is. If you do need credentials, you can pass through username, password, and domain. And in some cases, you might need to enable the SSL. It's always worthwhile testing this quite thoroughly. Um, because obviously you're just going to get an exception bubble up at the end if one of those options is not working for you. Now obviously we would call the mail.send message. In our example there's no way to send it. We'd end up with an exception so we're just going to return. As far as code and setup goes, that should be absolutely everything. So I think I set the questions at the startup page earlier to make sure and then let's run what we've built and have a look at it in real life. So to start without building or debugging and here we can see that we've got that introduction panel sitting at the top. I change the styling around to make it sit within. You'd normally wait for this to render. You'd normally be building this inside maybe a master page or some other framework that you've got. So your panel is going to look a lot more in tune with the rest of your page. But what we can see here is we've got these section headers, these groups that are set up correctly. And then we've got this beautiful interaction where the user can come through and type in answers to questions. Any question that they've answered, they're going to see the results of in the green. As we scroll down, we can see that there's no save changes or cancel changes option that got hidden and placed out of sight. Instead, we're going to see this submit button tucked away in the bottom right hand corner. Scroll down to it. And so when I choose submit, I'm going to get that client side event happening and everything else has been removed. Thank you. One of the team will be in touch. Whoever's maintaining the site is then going to receive that email saying, here's the answers to my questionnaire. So all in all, we've got less than 150 lines of code inside the implementation, notwithstanding that mailer class. And we can very quickly use the grid view control to do our administration 
and deliver an outstanding way of interacting with our clients to deliver that type of information. So now it's over to Amanda to see what questions have come in. Hey Paul, so um, from Mark, and this was a while back, about 20 minutes ago, is there a recommended way to use the smart tag feature for nested controls? It takes time to drill down into nested controls using smart tags edit templates. So I suppose it depends which, which camp you like to um, uh, sit in sometimes. I'm a big fan of doing a lot more work now just inside the HTML um, or the markup window rather than stepping through complex tags. Smart tags are great for jumping in and doing quick things, but as you point out, there can be a number of times, particularly in nested environments, where they become quite tricky. So I don't know that there's any necessary best practice or just maybe get more familiar with the markup. All right, and do you think we can use the layout control to build a similar questionnaire? You could use the layout control certainly for the bottom panel of what I showed before. The, the beauty of using the grid control though is the, is the binding, the built-in fact that it's really easy to have that dynamic if you're dealing with a static number of questions or things like that, um, it's about choosing the right tool for the right job. All right, and from Larry, will um, and you may have addressed this. Uh, what is the best way to handle question types that vary by question rather than all simply being yes or no? I, I.e., each question could be yes, no, true, false, one to five, etc. It's a great question, Larry, and as I said earlier on, there are so many places you could extend this simple example of doing that. And when I was writing up some notes for today's presentation, I thought it would be great homework for some of you out there to come back and show us how you've extended that to do exactly that. There are, I don't have any particular plans to go through and add complexity to this example, uh, but it certainly wouldn't be um, yeah, a mammoth job by adding in another table of question types that you could choose while you're setting up your questions and so on. Uh, can you prevent the user from leaving the page and never submitting without giving a warning that they will lose the info entered? Well the beauty with the grid, uh, grid view control here, the minute you try and leave the page you are automatically prompted to say that you will lose your information and it gives you the dialogue to say stay on page or leave page. So it's not just a matter of them clicking somewhere else and everything disappearing. They will be prompted. Um, okay, if a grid is pulling thousands of rows on a single page, how can you apply Ajax functionality to pull say only 40 rows on page load and continue to load the grid as the user scrolls down? Any examples or samples of this? That's another great question. Now, on some of our other webinars that are available on our YouTube channel, we go into a lot of detail on how you can use that exact functionality inside the grid view control. Using the paging, it can be implemented as the pager. We've got things such as endless scrolling, so that the user, as they scroll down the grid, we go off and do a fetch. The grid view control itself is one of the most outstanding products for data handling that I've ever come across. We've used it with literally millions of rows of data and had extreme performance. So uh, if, you, if you download a copy of the trial from our website, you'll see some examples in the demo center that gets installed as well, showing you just exactly how to do that. Um, and sorry if I'm totally butchering this question. Um, are all the functions of the grid view possible with joins of multiple tables? So there's a couple of ways that you can you can do that. Obviously, if you're using joins, you're going to need to maybe do custom update statements, and you can certainly implement custom custom instructions whether you're using views, whether you're using just straight SQL it comes back to what you want to achieve with the grid control. So if you're joining 
you know, five different tables, then you've got to decide what's happening with your update statement. You can pass it back to a stored procedure. You can lock the fields into parameters in the stored procedure. So it certainly is very versatile and handles some complex situations. Can we use MVC and ASP.NET Web Forms in the same project to move towards MVC? Yes, you can. And interesting, you brought up MVC because in a couple of weeks, it might even be next week, uh, I'm actually going to do an intro to MVC specifically for developers that have come from a web forms background. And we'll be looking at what MVC is all about and how to make that transition. But with the inside a project inside Visual Studio, you can mix and match MVC uh, with web form uh, pages. Awesome. That is all of the questions. Excellent. Well, if there is any other question or people want to reach out, my contact details are on screen. Obviously, we would love you to, if you haven't already downloaded a trial version, jump on our website. This presentation will be made available on our YouTube channel later on in the day. And keep your eyes on the DevExpress webinars page for up and coming presentations. Uh, we obviously love to hear from you guys and really appreciate you taking the time to spend it with us this morning. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. And like you said, we do have uh, several upcoming webinars at devexpress.com slash webinars. A couple coming up. Uh, we have one tomorrow, November 12th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. DevExpress WPF controls creating modern UI apps. See how you can leverage the flexibility and power built into our grid, chart, and multi-purpose WPF controls in order to create elegant, modern UI apps that will run across multiple versions of the Windows operating system. And then next Tuesday, November 18th, Paul is back with DevExtreme Mobile, build, test, debug, and deploy. See how to create a mobile application tar targeting iOS, Android, and Windows Mobile. Use Visual Studio to create the user interface as well as code and debug. Explore the rich collection of widgets to enhance the user experience and create distribution certificates and deploy to each of the stores. And then November 25th, this is the webinar Paul was talking about, uh, DevExpress MVC extensions getting started. Uh, see how to use the DevExpress template wizard, get the most from the scaffolding wizards to save time in coding, set up and configure critical elements of a data-driven site, including data grids, editors, and themes. So that one is November 25th. It's a Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And there are more coming, so again, you can always register and check them out at devexpress.com slash webinars. And that is it for this one. Thank you to Paul. Thank you for joining us. And of course, thank you for choosing DevExpress. Bye-bye.